me. Hey, man. Thank you. Mike, I appreciate you. I'm Denny Barrett. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I'm nervous as hell having you on this darn thing, man, because once I do a little research on you, now I did, and I already knew all about you, but then you do research on a guy, then you go, holy cow, I may be out of my league here a little bit, but uh, this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun a little bit. Okay. I, I uh, no. Hey, if you're a friend of Kevin, you're a friend of mine, and very. Uh, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, Kevin's a Kevin. I see him two or three times. His son Beckett's a pretty good player. You know, he's a pretty good yep. baseball player, and um, we get him out here. And and, uh, and again, Kevin. Kevin's been really kind to me. This podcast, he seems to like. It's not a. Um, it's not a. Uh, what it is 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 we just kind of see which way it flows, and you know, just way it flows, and then. Uh, uh, but I'm not here to. You're the uh, you're the guest, and and we it, there's not a whole lot of uh, rambling going on. I'll just we go back and forth, and and we can edit things out, put it on in, and and uh, and so forth. But God, the this is episode number forty six. I'm on number forty six, man. How about that? I'm I'm getting I'm it, it, it's still lasting. It's getting up there. It's getting up there. It's and my listener is just Rob, <laughs> so you have one guy. That's it. So uh, it'll it'll open up your. Uh, your celebrity status, if you have any. Uh, anyway, my name is Denny Barrett, and, and, and uh, we're episode what 46, right? forty-six. Yeah, it's called "Swing Hard in Case You Hit It," and we're with Mike Tannenbaum. And Mike, I was watching that. This is you're the ESPN NFL front office insider guy, right? Is that kind of how you? What, how do you? What would be your title with ESPN? That's it. So my job is, you know, I get to work with tremendous people like. Dan Orlovsky and Ryan Clark and Adam Schefter. And a lot of them are going to tell you what happened. My job is to explain like why it happened, how it happened, what it means. Yeah. And I, you know what? I don't think there's a lot of people out there that know what, what goes on up there. And uh, all we see is every Sunday, you know, we see the coaches, we see the show put on there. We see what the, what the, what the networks want to put out there. Then we see, we hear how important let me ask you straight up. What is the definition of a general manager? That's a great question. It's really like being the head, head of the HR department. You know, we're, we're in the ultimate people business. And if you're starting corner, got into a fight with his girlfriend or somebody broke up with them or some, uh, you know, a parent of, of a coach or a player fell ill, um, you'd be amazed like what you deal with. And it's the ultimate people business. And I, one of the things that I really struggled with early in my career, I was very fortunate. I was the assistant GM of the Jets for five years, right. became the GM in the same building. And I really had no idea what I was doing from a standpoint of like, I'm a very task oriented person. Yeah. And I would come in with a list of things I want to do, like scout or look at salary cap stuff. And a lot of days I never even got to my list and I would go home feeling very unfulfilled um, and we were very fortunate. I was working with a, a gentleman named Eric Mangini. He was our head coach. Yeah. Who did a wonderful job. We had a lot of on-field success. And, and that was really good for me because it allowed me to develop and really understand what the role of a general manager was. God, I get a chance to hear you. And I know people out here know with Mike Tannenbaum. Now, I've watched a couple. I've watched you a lot. And again, I just became at 57 years old. I just became a little boy now that I'm on this podcast talking to Mike Tannenbaum. They call you Mike T. Is that right? I've been called a lot worse, too. Okay. <laughs> but I thought, I thought Mike T. OK, I'm not at that status yet, but I was listening to the guys the other day. And, and uh, to when you communicate, a part of your job as a general manager is to be able to communicate with every aspect of an organization, I assume, president head coach, assistant coach, players, that's got to be a challenging day when you show up to the office, yeah? Well, and, you know, I got to tell you, um, early in my career, Coach Parcells, Bill Parcells, really helped me understand what it means to be an effective communicator. And I think the people that are most effective at that are ones that understand their audience. And you have to play point guard. You have to explain things to ownership. You have to explain things to a head coach, how you're going to deal with the media, how you're going to deal with agents, players, it's different audiences and you have to be able to effectively communicate the words you use, how you dress, it all matters. And um, coach yeah. Parcells was really, really, really influential in really the formative years of my career where we talked about all those sorts of things. And his point was like, he didn't coach every player the same way. Yeah, no, I could, 
God, I could see that again. I'm a full on sports guy. Baseball's the, is, is been my path, my avenue to create great relationships with people. I mean, it's just been beautiful. You wonder why a guy like me is still in this thing at just at my level. And I got to believe a guy like you in this is that you, you enjoy, you enjoy to get to build these relationships with new people, old, new, past, present, and so forth. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I was really like energized by, uh, and candidly still am is, you know, just to pick a name randomly, Lavernius Coles or Curtis Martin. And, and there's literally been hundreds of like going back to Vinny Testaverde or Larry Me Tunsil, Xavier Howard, Minka Fitzpatrick. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. Mike Pouncey, like just like to hear them talk and their backgrounds and what they've overcome, you know, I really I knew how fortunate I was, but you get around more and more people and and you know, the highs of seeing Curtis Martin sign a thirty-six million dollar deal. And his mom coming in for the press conference, and I, I said to her, "Hey, Miss Martin, are you going to go out and celebrate in New York City?" And she said, "No, I run a secondhand clothing store. Oh. I got to get back to work." Or other players we signed for massive extensions, and they said, "Hey, you can't let this get out because you know people will come ask me for money," which was really, really sad. Right. Um, once had a star quarterback sign a big, 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 big extension and said, "You know what?" Um, my brother's getting married this weekend and in our family, it's always about me. You know, this weekend it's going to be about him. We, we can't tell about anybody about this extension. <laughs> and, you know, we sat on a, like whatever it was, 40, $50 million deal for 72 hours. And I just said, I thought it said so much about his character and just over the years, just being inspired by people of like just such disparate backgrounds and right. what their passions were, what they've overcome to get to the highest levels yeah, um, can't can't like I, I was in awe of a lot of them. I got to tell you, that's just the opposite of having you on my podcast because I told everybody what the hell's going on here. Okay, I I said out there, I said we're gonna. This is about a month ago. I said I'm getting Mike Tannenbaum on this, so there was no uh, there was no humility on my part, brother. I apologize on that. So so take take for what it's worth on that. Hey, let me ask you now. You got a little bit of baseball background when I saw. I'm looking at a, a team called the Pittsfield Mets. That was in, you started with the Pittsfield Mets in, uh, in Massachusetts. Am I correct there? 1991, I put cheese on the nachos and rolled out the tarp. I'll tell you what, rolling out the tarp of a uh, tarp that was wet from rain was really, really heavy. Yeah. But really, you know, it's always about one thing. Choose a job you love, you never work a day in your life. And that's the most important thing. And that experience really like centered me on what I want to, why I wanted to do it. Now you were a finance guy. So, all right. I, and again, I'm generalizing. I, this is Mike Tannenbaum. I'm Denny Barrett. This is the first time we've met. I'm a huge fan of yours, Mike. I watch you every time I see you on the, uh, on, on the ESPN NFL, uh, you know, the, the, the network. And, and uh, now I'm talking to you, which is absolutely kill, blowing me away. But I, as a fine, did you know, were you a sports guy growing up? Your parents' sports? Were you sports? I, talk to me about growing up a little bit. Yeah, uh, I was really influenced by a gentleman named Red Auerbach. He was a longtime wow. head coach, GM of the Boston Celtics, sure. Boston. And um, we used to sit around the kitchen table for, for breakfast. And the Boston Globe was one of those newspapers that you could pull it apart and each people could write, read different sections. Yeah. I used to sit down and say to my mom hey give me the sports section and she said you know one day you're gonna have to get a real job like there's more <laughs> in the world than sports and I, I was just trying to prove her wrong and uh you know i really sports is what i loved and i watched red Auerbach, and that's what i wanted to do did you ever get a chance to meet red Auerbach? i did not you but did. i i greatly admired him so that means then you're a you were a celtic fan growing up i assume and then uh uh, our, first, our first dog was named Larry after Bird. And, uh, oh wow, wow, man! Uh, the that rivalry between the Lakers and the '80s, the Lakers and the uh, you know the Celtics, there's nothing better. I, again, I'm old enough to to recognize that that was what just intrigued me about watching these guys. It, it it obviously Laker fan, but then I get to appreciate. I talked to players today about to appreciate this game, and how do you appreciate it? You appreciate it by absolutely delving in and 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 go in there it's okay to compete it's okay to have a competitive have a uh, have a rival you know the one thing i miss today sometimes is that rivalry in, in sports 
uh, of where two teams go at it and they go at it and they go at it and you can tell they want to kick each other's tail. However, uh, they can look back on it now and, and say, man, yeah, they have these great stories in between. I hear McHale talking about and Bird talking about then with Magic and, and, and Worthy. It's wonderful that what goes on out there. And as a general manager, if you I got to talk about poor guy, Cornbread what? Maxwell, 31. I mean, he okay. was the first Philly of that team. Very underrated defensive player. We could go seven deep on that 86 team. And when you have like Jerry Sing Sting and Bill Wong coming off the bench, Rockets had no chance. But I always felt like Maxwell was the most underrated part of that team, as great as McHale and Bird were. The only problem is, though, Coach, if, if I could call you Coach, I'm sorry, uh, God, Mike, if, why couldn't you get the air conditioner to work in the garden, man? I mean, that was something that used to get me. My poor Lakers would go out there, and you come off. They looked like they were done after the first quarter. We'd also shrink the nets, make the ball come out a little bit slowly. Oh, see, Auerbach then, that's why I like Red Auerbach. He shrunk the nets. I learned something new every day. That makes perfect sense because you get that running team, the showtime, getting the ball through the nets and bring it back out the other day, uh, the, the other way. Hey, so when you um, so when you got out of college, you went to college, your old goal was to be was to be in the to, to be upstairs and be as a general manager, assistant GM. Uh, there's one thing on here I see. Uh, what's a director of player contracts? I never knew that was even a, a, a title. Yeah, neither did I. So, um, <laughs> so. And, and, you know, for people that are listening to this that want to work in sports yeah, or, or really just generally speaking, it's about creating value. So I was unbelievably lucky. Basically, I was in law school when the first salary cap was in its nascent stage in football and I studied it and I got hired to basically run the salary cap for the Jets as Coach Parcells was the GM and the head coach. So my value was that I understood the salary cap and how to negotiate contracts in that system. And that, that's what I was able to do uh, for a while. And, you know, there's a difference between a skill and a job in your career. Like the job is what you get paid to do. These are for-profit institutions and you get paid, you have skills. How? Go ahead. Go, please go. Keep your, going. Your career is you need to enhance skill sets and develop new skills to get ahead. And if you're really good at your job, you earn the right to do other things. Man, you do a class. I know you teach a class, the, the inner workings of the NFL at Columbia University. Are you still doing that? Yes, sir. Okay. When you say the inner workings, this is what you're talking about right here. Can a guy get into, uh, can a guy get into what you're doing? Can a guy get into the, to, uh, at an age, say 40 or 50? I mean, or, or do I, is my only general manager uh, experience going to be on fantasy football for the rest of my life? Is that, is that all I got? <laughs> No, I, absolutely. There are people that transition in all the time. And your next job is not your last job. You're trying to build a career and not look for a job. So just try to make meaningful progress every day. Godly. I, now I'm getting nervous. You know, you're a very smart man, Mike. And, and, uh, and, and guys like us that think we're smart just get humbled when you're in conversation with a guy like you. Who makes the decisions? The general manager or the head coach? Now, when I look at baseball out here at Dodger Town, we got Dave Roberts as our head coach. And, but there is so much controversy sometimes of that. He does it. He may make the lineup, but really the general manager is what's making all the decisions. Talk to me about that is in, in any sport, whether it's football or baseball, you guys take a lot of heat back and forth sometimes. Yeah. And I would say like an effective GM is making sure that everyone feels vested in the decision because that gives you the best outcome, the best chance to have the best possible outcome. So I always felt like my job description ultimately was point guard. I want to sit between the head coach and owner and say, hey, if we do this, guys, let's talk about you're out in California with the Rams. If we trade for Matt Stafford, here's the dead money on Jared Goff. Here's the draft choice allocation. Here's what our team is going to look like. So we're going to play with, you know, um, a free agent at linebacker or corner. Do we feel like with all that information collectively, that's what's best for us? And let's see the GM, the Rams obviously has done a very good job, but that's what being an effective GM is. It's really, and um, one of the things, one of the signs we had up in the office was in God, we trust for everyone else. We need data. And really what that stood for was basically, if we're going to disagree, let's look at more, get more information to make the best decision. Man. So when you, when you're in this, so you're doing the, 
the big picture, the most important part of the, putting the team together, GM. But when it comes to game day, game day stuff, do you meet in the morning that day or during that week? Does the head coach and you and the, and the owner meet that morning or whatever it may yeah. be? So, so there's an idiosyncratic rhythm to an NFL sort of ecosystem. And what I mean by that is typically the, the Monday is going to be the autopsy. What went well, what went badly. And then I always talk within our organizations about guys, like we want to be in the business of first guessing, not second guessing. So to the extent that the front office can provide insight for what's going to happen in the game, what matchups we like, we want to have all those suggestions out on the table. And then by Friday, we'll hear from the head coach, like what the plan is, what the strategy is. And, and in a cap system over 17 games, there's going to be matchups that are really in your favor and ones that are really going to be hard. Mm-hmm. And you just try to minimize your weakness and exploit your strengths. And you really want to be going into the game, just again, aligned with what the head coach is trying to execute. And then afterwards, you know, and I think I got better at this over time. Like sometimes it's like, you know, after a loss, you just got to let it sit for a day and ask the hard questions the next day. Yeah. God, Lee, that makes that it just, the more I'm listening to you, the more it sounds like, well, it's obviously you're the head of the family on this general manager. You're the, I mean, the owner is the owner, but the general manager, you're the, you're in charge of the family right there. You, you, you want to keep guys happy. Yet there's got to be some challenging questions you're going to have to ask that head coach on Monday, I assume. Do you ever ask him, hey, man, when it's fourth and three, why don't we go for it? Why don't we punt the ball? Is those, those kind of questions come out or do you just, some things are just, un, we don't talk about on Monday after a tough loss on Sunday or a bad decision on Sunday night. And I don't mean to get too personal. I'm just, I'm just asking that those Mondays in you're right. And so when you watch a game, you're watching it differently, obviously than Denny Barrett's watching it. You're watching it. You're taking notes. I assume you're, 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 you got things to talk about on Monday. Am I correct? Or maybe I'm off. Yeah, no, it's totally right. And, and again, I think it's also the expression. It's like, not what you say, it's how you say it. And coach fourth and three, you decide to go for it. Can you just walk me through on, on how you got to that decision? God, I got to assume then some coaches probably don't like that question. I, I, I got to assume a Monday I got beat. I get beat in a 14 U baseball game. I don't want to talk to someone until Wednesday. You guys have to ask those questions to, uh, are there, there's a lot of egos in the professional sports. And, and I know I can see, listening to you, you recognize who's got the egos and, and who doesn't have the egos and what areas you can tap into egos when you're drafting guys, what's it take the, the draft, the combines, that's a big deal now. And, and I got to assume today there's a lot of research you're doing on players. You spend a just as much amount of research on your number one or number two pick that you do on your number eight pick or number nine pick, or what's, what's a draft go through the week prior and, and on that day, if you don't mind me asking that. Yeah. So it actually starts the May before it's an 11 month process. Ugh. And one of my big philosophies is who you are in life is how you treat the waiter or waitress, how you treat people that can't help you. So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to get to know someone's true character because when you give them a lot more money, it's just going to amplify who they are, both good and bad. Mm-hmm. So if you coming up, we got the draft coming up. You, you already know as where you're at right now is you probably already know talking to the GM. You already know where certain guys are going. Don't you? They, do you guys, if you, as a GM, do you already know who you're picking right now? Your first pick or your first five picks? It's the world's biggest poker game. So you may have a rough idea of like, here's three or four guys, but you're playing firmly etched in pencil because you really don't know what's going to happen. God, Lee, man. Um, as a general manager, then you come home late in the day and you got to take the trash out, but you still got to work on the first round pick. What do you do first? Take the trash out or the first round pick that you got to focus on at home? So I, actually, I'll tell you a great story at confluence of those two things. So we, we went through a situation in 2016 where we got a great player in Laramie Tunsil. Laramie Tunsil is a great person. He unfortunately had made a mistake, and he was um, doing something that a lot of people in our country do. Yeah. But there was a video of it in real time that looked awful. The optics were awful, and it scared away a lot of teams. We wound up taking him. Well, I was doing backflips. We got the best player in the draft at 13. I, I couldn't believe how lucky we were. Wow. So I get back from into my office that night, leave the draft room. It's late and I'm wrapping things up. And I call my wife. I'm like, can you believe we got Laramie Tunsil? Like, it's unbelievable. Like what a great night for us. And my wife, Michelle was like, 
well, you have a father problem because you have two kids that are absolutely scared to death and can't understand why you would draft a guy like that. I'm like, can you just handle it? And she's like, <laughs> no, you got to handle it. I'm like, and, you know, it was one of those, like, honest, sober moments of, like, you know, it's being a parent's, you know, a tremendous responsibility. Yes. And you, you know, put on the hat of you're zealously trying to improve your team. You know that he's a really good person who had made a mistake. And of all things, like, my kids were a little bit younger then, and they were totally frightened by it. and couldn't understand, like, why would we want to have a player that sinister in our team? And it was a turned out to be a really good thing because they actually met him the next day. Yeah. And the whole notion of like good people make mistakes. And here's Laramie. Laramie's like this like gentle giant. He could right. have been more kind, but it was a, one of those moments about, you know, the first, the, your first round pick and taking the trash out. Hey man, good. And good for your wife to call you out on that right away. You know what? If you know- yeah. If, if, if you know her, that was not aberrational. <laughs> I, I love the thought of coming home that drive home with a big smile on your face doing backflips and the first the first comment is yeah i get it dear talk to the kids you, you yeah, talk exactly. to the kids yeah 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 get your ass in here yeah. and take care of this <laughs> right hey talk to me about the players today comparison contrast uh of the players that are going through the combine today is the ones that went through back in 90 91 92 is there a difference am i making that up or is there a different approach today with these uh, with these with these athletes today? Yeah, no, it, it's really um, it's a great question. Nowadays, things are so different with um, NIL, the transfer portal, social media. Yeah. So, but really, the most important thing is like fundamentally, when you cut these players in half, like what oozes out of them? I want to know that they're a world class competitor, that they love football, that they go play in the parking lot in as much as you know, for a 10, 15, whatever it is, $20 million. And you really got to get into their understanding of like, what's their why? Like, why do they play? And there's nothing wrong with, hey, making a lot of money is a big part of it. We all have a family to feed. But what else? Like, do they just ooze? Like, do they want to win a preseason game? Do they want to win? Like, I want to know that they're world-class competitors. Yeah, man. How far back do you go, Mike, on a – on these kids, like I, I, so I coach at the collegiate level and, and again, and, and I coach at the, at the high school level. And then, and now I get a chance. I get to, I've changed my vocabulary instead of saying I have to, I get to, I get to learn by 12 and 14 year olds that are pretty good athletes. They're going to, that, that have this goal in life to, they have this fantasy. I'd love to have to make it a reality, but they have a fantasy, I think. And until they don't, but what do you, uh, what are you telling what are you telling these new kids that are coming in today, man, their option, their opportunities or options coach comes to my kid, my, uh, sir, I want to play for the jets. I want to play for the saints. I want to play. Everybody wants to play. What separates those guys that are in that are, that are playing for you and the guys that you got to cut. So Rex Ryan used to talk about this all the time. He had a great line, which was the best athletes on the planet are walking the streets. The best ones, the ones with the most talent, they're out on the streets. The ones that are sitting in the seats in, in NFL meeting rooms across the country are the great athletes that also have the systemic discipline. You know, there's a great line, Bill Curry, former head coach of Alabama. He had sure. a great line. There's two types of pain in life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And which pain do you choose? And the well, ones that choose the pain of discipline have a chance to sit in the seats in, in the NFL uh, facilities across the country. God. Bless you, man. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And shit, man, at my age, I even at my age, I look back and go, man, oh man, the regret hurts a lot more than the discipline. I can tell you right now to sit back and go, fuck, shoot, heck, I wish, I wish, I wish. I, I love that line. Does um when you sign a kid, when you're signing a kid, you know, people look on socially what guys are making or when you re-sign a guy what's the what's the bit by the way we had ryan on here a while back let me get to that that's i forgot i was gonna say when you and ryan disagree on a guy who wins out the head coach or the general manager or does ryan get pissed and walk out of the room when i saw you guys on uh what's that football the nfl football show i think i saw hard knocks, hard knocks. i think ryan was pissed or something and he didn't, didn't get a guy or didn't want a guy or had to cut a guy how does go on yep. 
so basically I used to say when um, I would disagree with Rex, it was very easy. I would walk in with an emergency venti mocha frappuccino. I watch him suck that thing down and I would always get my way. And if it was a really big disagreement, I would get extra whipped cream and I just can't <laughs> Rex and I was good to go. So <laughs> who go ahead. Who make but with that, do you ever does it is it do you hold grudges for a long time? Like there's a guy. Yeah. 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 So in all seriousness, um, I ran the Jets, was in my contract. I could do whatever I wanted. I had final say on everything, but I never, ever, ever as a leader would want to do something that Rex didn't want to do. Now, if we had a disagreement that I felt strongly about, again, in God we trust for everyone else, we need data. Let's be a process driven organization. It's not about who yells the loudest. Let's think it through. Let's look at it. Let's drill down and let's just keep looking at it until we get to a place where because if I just indiscriminately say, hey, Rex, F you, this is what we're doing. Yeah. That's not building a sustainable environment. And I think one of the things that I feel great about is all the coaches and people that I've worked with over 20 plus years. And I still hear from them. A day doesn't go by that I don't talk to someone who, you know, is working on something similar to what we did or just a lot of great long term, authentic relationships. Man, yeah, got it. it- does uh does today now and we'll go back to the players today stronger character i, I, I use these terms character I, I i don't know there's that intrinsic motivation i keep telling players you gotta have this intrinsic motivation we had a couple of pro guys on a couple of weeks ago freddie sanchez with the pirates saying he either hated to lose or he wanted to win too bad nothing in between there uh how much research how do you know if a guy really is a competitive guy that wants to go out there's going to give you a, a wants to win that preseason game until that day comes where you spend four million bucks on the guy or hundred million dollars on the guy great question i got much better that um behavioral based interviewing um i want to ask some questions like tell me something that you've worked hard at but have been unable to accomplish what's one thing you change about yourself give me an example of where you've been a great teammate who do you call when you have a bad day um, wow. th- there's a lot of ways you can try to figure out how a person is constituted. Wow, man. That, that's simple. Whether they're alignment and all the same questions for guys. How do you know when you put a team together, Mike, that they're going to get along? You know, is it the Oakland A's of 72 where they can't get along, but they still win? Does it matter if they get along in the pros? Does it, does it even matter anymore? Or, or are you trying to still be yeah. a team unity? Yeah, great question. Um, that's not easy to answer. Um, I think... You know, Nick Saban has a great expression about this. He talks a lot about how highly motivated people don't tolerate people that aren't highly motivated. Like they don't get along very well. So if you're filling your organization up with tough, hardworking, smart, competitive people, they'll be, they may not like each other, but they'll respect one another, but they won't tolerate people that aren't giving their all. And that's our job is to, fill the program up with those types of people. Do you know early enough when you make a trade as well? So you're going out to make a trade, big time trade. There's some big ones that came up that the uh, guy, the, the, uh, the chiefs guy went over there with the, to Miami. Ty- Tyreek Hill. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just look at it from the outside going, okay, big time guy, but they got four guys coming this way and draft picks and so forth is, is a, uh, does a guy, so a guy doesn't necessarily get traded out of an organization, a big time guy. Because he's a because he's a cancer, I assume it's it's a business, and they're trying to find to make the Chiefs are trying to make it better, or is it or is there some cancer involved? Yeah, no, it could be a little bit of everything. It, it could be character, durability, economic scheme fit. Um, you know, we've seen some trades with Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill where it was a resource allocation discussion. So um, because their quarterbacks are both making a lot of money, um, so it's just one of those things where um, there could be a number of reasons a player is available. Hey, why did I got my brother, big Packer fan, big time money guy, pisses me off because I like the Vikings and I always have. I was a big fan, Tarkington fan back in the day, you know, the purple people leaders and they're 0 and 4 in a Super Bowl, Bud Grant. I can go on and on, Mike. I got some knowledge on me, man. I could tell you about my Viking experience. It's been hurting me ever since. But why did they draft love and nothing against personally against love? Was that it? And I don't know if you can answer this. Tell me, Denny, shut your mouth. Next question. But why would they go after love when they got, the best quarterback sometimes. And I wasn't going to even ask this question. I apologize, Mr. Tannenbaum. I wasn't going to ask this, but I want my brother to know that why would they draft love? Did they think they were going to use the guy or they were going to get rid of maybe, or 
Is it all hearsay? Or maybe he was just a good player in the first round. Yeah, I think it was the right uh, plan and poorly executed. And here's what I mean by that. So he's not going to play forever. And if you go back a generation, and ironically, I um, traded for Brett Favre because they knew they had Aaron Rodgers behind him when I was a GM of the Jets. But Great what call. I would tell you is they needed to draft his replacement who maybe needed a couple of years to be ready. Yeah. Two things happened. Aaron Rodgers, from a longevity standpoint, lasted longer than they thought, A. And then, B, Jordan Love just hasn't played as well as they had hoped. Okay. So I think it was the right principle and not executed correctly. Wow. So – so that's putting it very kindly, very, very, yeah, I, I get that. that. And I understand what you're saying there. And that, that makes sense. I love it. I, I was hoping as just a fan that Rogers was going to go over to Denver and, and, uh, and then love was going to take over there. And maybe my Vikings could, could have a chance of those, those guys sometime, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Hey, it says here, I'm with Mike Tannenbaum and, and we're just talking that one of the most uh, successful general managers and assistant GM director of contracts, Mike, you're also a, uh, devoted to philanthropic endeavors, helping young people get their start in sports. Tan and, uh, Tannenbaum remains true to one of the, uh, I love your core values, that education and knowledge, education and knowledge will always have a successful path. What do you mean by that? Well, like for me, like choose a job you love, you never work a day of your life. Like I, I really wanted to work in sports, but I also got a law degree to fall back because education is something that can never be taken away from you. And it gives you skills in a meaningful way to, you know, make your way through the world. I also think it's, uh, it's a, an enlightened sort of journey from a standpoint that the more environments I put myself into, and even teaching at Columbia, I can't tell you how much I've learned. You know, I grew up in a small town outside of Boston, and I just love learning from others and, and putting myself in an environment where I know the least, I'm the most uncomfortable, I'm the minority. Um, and it's been a more of a fulfilling sort of, uh, path for me. So I, I, I'm very appreciative of the different opportunities I've had. And I just try to learn from people with varied backgrounds. God, it must be challenging. I mean, for you to learn from, to hear you say it humbles all of us that are listening. And again, we have about close to 6,000 listeners. It's not huge. You've got your, that ESPN, you're dealing with millions and millions and, and your business coming at New York. I mean, a small town Boston guy being a general manager in New York. Wow. I mean, that's, that, that's a, and then to give all this stuff away, but it, it just seems to what I'm hearing from you and seeing you, we're with Mike Tannenbaum, uh, look him up. You get a chance to meet this guy somewhere on the streets. He's a giver. You just give away all the knowledge and, and all the values that you have. You're into giving this stuff away to your players. I assume. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people invested in me at a time when I probably didn't deserve it, including a couple of Hall of Fame coaches and, Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells and, you know, the expression to whom much is given, much is expected. And when I became the, the GM of uh, the Jets, I did two things. One is I bought my father his first new car that he ever had because he always gave more to my sister and I. Wow. And then we just started a scholarship where we gave financial wherewithal to people to work for free so they could pursue their dreams as well. And that's great. Now, we had one guy in a couple weeks ago from Boston, from Worcester, Worcester, Massachusetts. Yeah. He's a big guy. We're going out. We're going out to Worcester in about three weeks to meet with the baseball, the college team. I think is it Worcester, Worcester State. Worcester State. And uh, I'm going to tell them that you and I now are close friends. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. I can say whatever the hell I want to say. It's my podcast on that. But uh, anything, Mike. Um, anything you want to get out to the to the to the people that are listening, the young, the coaches, the the parents that it because they're not all going to make it in the NFL. What's the path? What could be a foundation for these young kids ages nine to 18? I, have, I coach at Notre Dame High School out here in Sherman Oaks. What would be a good last suggestion for these guys to, 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 to follow a path of, of, of a, maybe not success as a professional athlete, but there is a path out there. Is there not for them? Yeah, it's about passion. You know, it's about passion. And be a great question asker and go through life you know, where, you know, we have this organization called the 3013. We have a completely free newsletter, 3013.com. And one of our key tenants, and we have 
500 years of experience in the NFL, head coaches like Wade Phillips and wow. Dan Quinn, Doug yeah. Peterson's of the world. Yeah. And one of the expressions we use is the, the key to life is what you learn once you know it all. And wow. if just go through life that way, like for all of us, like keep learning, keep reading, keep listening to podcasts, keep asking the right questions, because that's how you're going to continue to improve. Man, where do we find you, Mike? Again, do you do a podcast at all? Or, or uh, the 33rd team? Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, 33rdteam.com. That's 33rd.com. Okay. At Real Tannenbaum on Twitter. And okay. uh, I know what you guys are all about. And I greatly appreciate you having me. Hey, man, I, I appreciate that too. But in next bad signing, I, if, if I'm going to look up some research now that I have your number. If there's another bad sign, like your, like your kids, I'm going to question you now. You're going to get a text from me. No, I'm kidding. No, nothing like that at all. Mike Tannenbaum, this was a good 40 minutes. I appreciate it. I appreciate you making the time. I know how challenging it is on your busy schedule, my friend. And um, and I, I I can't thank you enough for being here, Mike. Thank you. Oh, no, my, my pleasure. I know what you guys are doing. And uh, I feel very fortunate that you would have me on and greatly appreciate it. And uh, look forward to following you guys and keep up the great work. Thanks, man. I'll tell Kevin you said hi. I'll, to be, I'll see him in about an hour. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, please yeah. do. But Beckett has a game. Beckett, we got practice tonight at 6 30, so Beckett's going to be there. But Kevin always comes up. Have you heard from Tannenbaum? And I'll say, not yet. It's going to happen. Then he get, he then he starts texting. I go, Kevin, I, it's okay. We're okay, man. And he's the one that's like, I'll get him. I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him. You know, Kevin. So uh, I said, no, we're, we're great. Thanks for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. If you need anything else, just let me know. I will too. Thanks, man. I'll Thanks, talk Mike. To you. Appreciate See it. You, nice to meet you. Uh -huh. yep. All right. Take care. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep.